Hello and welcome back to another episode of the V8 Supercars Fancast. My name is Kendall. I will be your host as always and do we have a lot of things to talk about today. My god, was there a lot of things that happened at the bend. So, for those of you that, well hopefully you've watched the race by now, but I'll go over it briefly. Today, or not today actually, last weekend was the, I think, round 11, uh, race 22 and 23 of the V8 Supercars Championship at a new international raceway called The Bend in South Australia. Uh, brand new track, used to be a Mitsubishi proving ground and testing track for um, their cars. Um, converted into a international raceway with, uh, I think, seven different layouts. Uh, the supercars were racing on the international layout, a 4.9 kilometer circuit. Um, very tight, very twisting, very different to most of the tracks on the calendar, which are quite fast and simple, or their street circuits, which again, uh, lots of 90 degree turns, not a lot of flowing corners in a street circuit. Um, the bend had, I think, 17 turns, which is probably the most. Maybe, maybe Bathurst has more, I'm not sure. Um, but it has a whole lot of turns, not a lot of straights. Um, and there's even a variant of the course that's almost twice as long as the one they were racing on. So it's a big track with lots of technical bits to it. Um, so as you can imagine, a lot of the teams were completely thrown off by this. We had some, sh uh, not shocking results, but we had some interesting people up near the top where normally they wouldn't be. And we had some people who were down near the bottom where they normally would be near the top on a more traditional track. Um, so we'll just get right into the results for um, for the first race. Um, and we'll start with qualifying for race 22 at the OTR Super Sprint at the Bend. First off... Jamie Winkup with a top lap of a 150.1, which is almost two seconds slower than the fastest time in practice the previous day. I've never seen such a disparate time between practice and qualifying. Um, I'm not sure why. Watching it, um, it, I'm not sure if it was the time of day, um, although practice two on... Uh, Friday should have taken place at roughly the same time as qualifying for race one, roughly. Um, I'm not sure what happened, um, but no one was able to put in a really fast time. Um, it's possible that one of, the, one of the support races dragged some dust onto the track, um, so they weren't able to put in the super quick times that they were putting in the day before. Um, but I will get to the dust because that's another talking point that I want to discuss. Um, but first, we'll keep going through qualifying. So Jamie Winkup in first place of a 150.1371. Shane Van Gisberg and his teammate in second of a 150.2. Michael Caruso in third of a 150.69. So nearly five temps down on uh, Shane Van Gisberg. And so the two Red Bulls comfortably at the front. Rick Kelly... As well, so a uh, second row lockout to the Nissans and a first row lockout to Red Bull. Uh, Rick Kelly with a 150.7. Scott McLaughlin in fifth. Not where we're used to seeing him. He really struggled this weekend at, um, at the bend. Um, I want to talk more about Scott as well. Um, but he really did struggle. And it's not wasn't just him. His teammate did... Just as badly, well, worse, actually. Um, and if anything shows the, what I think is a real chasm in their uh, in their driving ability, it's it's this weekend, I think. Um, Coulthard is not at the same level as McLaughlin. Um, and it, this really does go to prove it. Um, because uh, they were saying all weekend, DJR was saying all weekend that they were struggling to find the right setup for the car. They were struggling to turn the tires on. Um, and Scott managed to finish in the top 10 both races, despite criticizing his own driving very heavily, um, despite the team fully admitting that the car was not up to scratch. Um, he managed to finish in the top 10 both times, whereas Coulthard um, wasn't even within a shout at all, um, especially in qualifying. 
So it really goes to show how strong of a driver um, Scott is. He can really pull out results out of a car that doesn't deserve to be there. He really can. Um, so props to him for making the best out of a bad time. Um, but, you know, anyway, continuing. Mark Winterbottom in six. That's, I think that's the best qualifying result we've seen from him in a long time uh, with a 150.9. So, really good to see him there. And next is Chaz Moster in 7th of a 151, followed by Cameron Waters of a 151.2. It is great to see three of the four Tickford cars in the top 10. Been ages since I've been able to say that, but it's nice to see them all up in there. Um, they didn't do so well in the race, not all of them. Um, but it's nice to see that they're finally getting that set up down. And uh, the bend was a perfect catalyst, a new, brand new track, complicated track, perfect catalyst to try and get these cars into some points. Uh, Tim Slade in ninth, um, he said the fastest time in practice one, he was looking really strong. Um, both the Brad Jones racing cars were looking really strong coming into this weekend. So a little disappointing to see him a bit further down than he probably should have been. Um, again, I think there was a bit of dust on the track, especially around turn five. They had problems all weekend with dust. Um, and the people who really nailed a time were the ones that went first. Um, and were also the ones that were able to, um, make the best of a bad situation, I suppose. Um, so I think Slade and Percat had real speed on them, um, but not quite the, maybe not the experience because both of them are pretty experienced now. Um, but maybe just not quite the wherewithal to, um, race in those sorts of changing conditions or put in, uh, not race, but a, a single quick lap in those sorts of conditions. Um, cause that's a different skill altogether. And it's something that we know that a lot of those top guys have by now. Um, Garth Tander in 10th, um, he had a poor weekend, but this qualifying result, not bad, not bad at all. Um, Will Davison in 11th, Nick Perkett in 12th. Again, he'll be a bit upset with that. Tim Blanchard, the first of the rookies in 13th. I don't know what happened, um, but he just did really well in the first qualifying session. I don't know why. Um, maybe it's because the field was very spread. Um, quite a big spread of times um, for this weekend in particular. So maybe that had something to do with it. I don't know. Um Normally, between first and last place in qualifying, there's only a second or so. Uh, from first to 13th, which is Tim Blanchard, we're already 1.3 seconds down on first place. So, uh, very widespread. And I think that might have something to do with it. I'm not sure, but good job to Tim. Um, first of the rookies. Lee Holdsworth in 14th. That's probably his best of the season um, from the top of my head. I'm not sure. I'm sure someone will say that it's, he's done way better at Adelaide or something, but... um. He, yeah, good job for him. He did pretty well this weekend. He got into a few tangles, which was unfortunate. Um, he did end up retiring from race two, but he did pretty well overall, I think. I was quite impressed with him this weekend. Uh, Jack LeBrock, the second rookie in 15th. James Golding behind him in 16th. David Reynolds in 17th. Not doing well on this track at all. Um, he did okay in the second race, but both his qualifying results were pretty poor. Um, I think it's mostly down to the fact that Davy just doesn't quite have the experience yet to race in, to race or put in a really quick lap on a track like this. Um, this is a very different track to what we're used to seeing in the supercars calendar. Most of the supercars tracks are not technical courses. They're not bad. There's not a, I wouldn't say there's any bad courses, but they're usually quite short um, and they're not very technical. Bathurst being the standout example, um, but Bathurst is the exception, not the rule. So Bathurst is a technical track and that's why it's so revered amongst the drivers on the field. The bend is very, very technical and um, I think there's even, I think even Jamie Winkup said that putting a fast lap on the bend is very similar to putting together a fast lap at Bathurst. Everything needs to go right and it's a very flowing track so you make a mistake on one corner and your time is ruined for the rest of that sector um, cause, because all the corners flow into each other and I think David just doesn't quite have the experience for that sort of thing yet. Yeah, I know he won Bathurst but 
he he also raced pretty effectively at the bend. It's just his single lap performance is a bit lacking. Um, I think that just might be where he needs a bit more experience. But he'll get that in time. He's still got plenty of growing to do. Andre Heimgartner in 18th. He'll be disappointed with that as well because he did very well in practice um, in the top 10 mostly. I'm pretty sure. Could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he was in the top 10. Um, Macaulay Jones, uh, wildcard entry in 19th. Good job to him. Really good job. Um, excellent to see him around. So, yeah, it's just good to see him back again. Um, he did pretty well both days, so good on him. Uh, Anton Di Pasquale in 20th. Simona in 21st, which I'm pretty sure she just lives in 21st. Um, Fabian Coulthard in 22nd, all the way down the back of the grid. But it gets worse because Scott Pye is in 23rd, followed by James Courtney in 24th, and then Craig Lowndes in 25th, a full two seconds off. Jamie Winkup's time. There's a lot of big boys at the back of the grid there. A lot of them. Um, Walkenshaw and Andretti clearly didn't get their car dialed in for the first session. Um, they were bad all practice. Uh, qualifying, they were bad. Um, much better during the race. And then uh, race or day two, Sunday, they did way better. Way better. So they just sort of needed to find their feet a bit. Um, Craig Lowndes, similar story. Um, he just didn't put in a good lap for qualifying. Um, I'm not really sure what happened to him in qualifying because he should have the same or similar access to the same setup that Red Bull has. Well, they're the same team, just a different sponsorship deal. Um, as Shane Van Gisbergen and Jamie Winkup, he should be having the same or similar setup. I'm not sure if it's his driving style or if he just put in a late lap and there was already dust on the track. Um, because, um, for those of you that didn't see qualifying, um, you did see some of this in the race, but, um, on turn five in particular, people would be, it's a very fast corner that you can't quite take flat, but when you're doing a qualifying lap, you want to push it as fast as you can. And there's lots of runoff at this track. There's no tight walls or anything. So people are, um, people would be pushing it all the way through turn five and trying to go as fast as they can. What would end up happening is that they'd either, they'd dip a wheel off on the apex over the ripple strip onto the grass or as they were coming, um, as they were exiting the corner, they would end up going wide over the ripple strip and onto the grass and rejoining the circuit. But this is a very dusty uh, area that they were in. Um, so every time they went off the track and brought and went back onto the track over the, over the, grass they brought on a ton of dust onto the road and as soon as that happened especially at turn five all the grip disappeared and turn five is a really fast corner so you can imagine all these people who are trying to push it it only takes one person to go off wide and come back onto the track um, or one person to miss the apex a little bit push it a little bit too hard throw some dust onto the racing line and then all of a sudden everyone's going off and then as soon as you got more people going off, you're making more dust come onto the track. So it just got worse and worse and worse. So the people who went first in qualifying were the ones that really got a good lap together early. And most people didn't improve upon their lap that they initially put in for this reason. Um, I think Craig might have just been a victim of that. I'm not sure. Um, Stanaway, similar issue, 26. Um... He had problems all weekend. Shocking weekend for him. Not necessarily his fault. Uh, Kirk Kostecki, 27th wild card entry. Um, nowhere near Macaulay Jones's time. Um, he was a full, almost four seconds down. He was 1.8 seconds slower than Richie Stanaway. Uh, but he was still faster than Todd Hazelwood, who for this weekend has switched back from a Ford Falcon supplied by DJR to a Holden Commodore supplied by uh, Red Bull Holden Racing Team. I don't know why. <laughs> it didn't seem to help. Um, Matt Stone, the uh, team principal, uh, said some things about um, developing the car for next year and that sort of thing. Um, so clearly they don't want the Mustang, maybe. I'm not sure. They clearly don't think the Falcon's working. Um, although it's not supplied by Tickford, it's supplied by DJR and their Falcon's fine, so I'm not sure. Um... I'm not really sure what they see the what advantage they think they'll get from switching to um the car that everybody else is using. Um but they seem to think they can develop it. 
Interestingly enough, um, it is the same car that, or well, it is the same brand of car that Todd Hazelwood used in Super 2, um, the development series. Um, and for some reason, when they moved, when they made the switch to the, the big leagues, they decided to change brands. I don't know why you wouldn't keep the car that you know moving up into the new series, but maybe that's why he's been so poor this, this season. Um, 4.1 seconds down from the lead. Um, yeah, Kirk Kostecki and Todd Hazelwood are really back there. Again, um, there were a lot of issues with this track in general, um, especially with the dust. If I could have some changes for next year that may be tarring the, um, the apex and the exit to turn five would be up there. Um, or maybe not even tarring, just AstroTurf like they have at the, uh, Melbourne Grand Prix. Um, just extra runoff so that they don't bring dust all over the track because it happened during the race as well. It just creates so many... It just creates so much drama where there doesn't need to be any. It's not the driver's fault that like, they can't tiptoe around this corner. They have to take it as fast as they can. But if there's any dust there, they just lose grip and then they go off and then the problem gets worse for everybody. Um, I know that tarring the road will make the drivers more aggressive on the corners and will get more line cutting and things like that like we did at Winton. Um, and that sort of thing, and Adelaide as well. I know that's just sort of the price you pay for this because I think it's worth it if we don't see people going off for no reason. Um, I want to see people making mistakes because they made a mistake, not because they took a corner and there's just dirt there. You know, like that's not their fault. Dirt doesn't belong on the racetrack. We're not, you know, it's not Rallycross. Um, we're here to see people race on tar, and I think if they're going to make any improvements at this track for next year, I would like to see the extremities of Turn 5 um, given some extra runoff to prevent this from happening. Because um, they really don't need to go very far. One wheel off the track and they've brought a bunch of dirt on. Like, it's it's like Barbagello. There's dirt everywhere. It's a dust bowl. So, um, yeah, I was a little, little taken aback by that. I mean, obviously, they can't account for everything when they build tracks like this. But just that quarter in particular... Obviously, this could happen at any corner, but because Turn 5, is it, specifically for supercars, is almost fast enough to take flat, but not quite, um, they're always really pushing it, especially in qualifying. And as soon as there's dirt on there, even if it's from qualifying, it gets bunched onto the track. Even from support races, gets put onto the track, ruins it for everybody else. I would like to see it just tart over a little bit. That would be my wish for next year. Otherwise, I think it's a pretty good track overall. Uh, made some pretty good racing. Um, not a lot of overtaking opportunities though. I was worried about that. I said it in the last, um, podcast that I was worried that there wouldn't be much opportunity for people to overtake. And I was mostly right. Even in turn one, there's a, it's a, uh, turn one is a right hander followed by a fast left hander and then immediately a tight right hander. So because it switches back so many times, they can't even really overtake into turn one. Um, which is where the big main straight is. Um, there weren't too many places. There were a few people taking, uh, doing overtakes on the last two corners. Um, some people were doing it at turn six, but that's again, it switches back into, it turn six is a left-hander, which switches back into, um, I think a triple right-hander. Um, so you really need to make that one stick. Um, and it's just, it wasn't a lot of overtaking going on. There was some, you know, it wasn't Formula One. Um, but, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of movement going on through cars that were evenly matched, I suppose, is a good way of saying it. If there was a chasm in the way the cars were obviously performing, um, they were slicing through the field, but that's just the way these things go. Um, so on to the race results, now that I've finished talking about the bend. Um, Shane Van Gisbergen in first place. So, um, yeah, so um, Shane Van Gisbergen in first place. Um, after he managed to get around his teammate, a uh, safety car came out, courtesy of Garth Tander pulling up onto the apex of the last corner um, and stopping his car with an engine issue. Um, Shane pits um, and they double stack with Jamie behind him, so obviously Jamie's race is ruined. Shane's laughing, he exits, gets a good start from off the Nissans and he goes and takes the race. Um... Yeah, I mean, you know, these things happen. That's what racing's about. It's unfortunate that Jamie got double stacked out of a out of a 
strong result. Um, but as we'll see going through here, he didn't exactly do badly anyway. Um, uh, Rick Kelly in second place. Um, another podium for him. Good job. Good drive. He had a strong car. Um, did pretty well to get around. Michael Caruso, who, was, who finished in third and... Held him up, it's fair to say, for quite a while. It was pretty clear that Rick Kelly had a stronger car, especially at the start of the race. Um, and uh, Scafi, our commentator, not, <laughs> not not a big fan of uh, Caruso holding up. He said many times that uh, that he was that he would just he just wanted Caruso to let Kelly pass or to team orders to uh, team orders to come into play. Um, I mean, you know. I like that there's not very many team orders in supercars. There is a few. Um, it does happen from time to time, especially with the top teams, but it doesn't really go on very often. Um, so we do get some good racing. It's just that the bend is such a hard track to pass on. And Rick Kelly saw this where he clearly had a stronger car than Caruso and he was just stuck there for laps. Um, couldn't do anything about it. Um, so we did eventually get around him on lap six. Uh, Jamie Winkup finished in fourth after coming out of the pits after being double stacked in, I think, eighth place. Um, fought his way back up and finished in fourth. So not a bad result, but he will be disappointed that he could have had a first or second place um, versus Shane. Uh, Mark Winterbottom in fifth, up one place from where he started. Good good race result from him. Managed to fend off a Scott McLaughlin behind him who finished in sixth place. Um, he did well to hold his position I think given how poor that car seemed to be um, I think he did a good job just staying there uh, Will Davison finishing in 7th good result from him um, he's actually been one of the stronger he's probably been the, the most consistent um, Falcon on the field that isn't a DJR car, car Sorry, um, I know Mostert's ahead of him in the championship but I'd be interested to see where he stacks up against the other Tickford cars because he's been pretty consistently in and around the top 10 all year. Uh, James Courtney up 16 places from 24th into 8th. What a day he had. He got an absolute flying start. He overtook five or six people before turn one, overtook even more people um, into turn three, Overtook more people in the turn six. If you um, have access to a computer or on your phone or whatever, I highly recommend that you look up, um, I think it's on the website, uh, James Courtney's start or a highlight of it. There's an onboard um, There's an onboard camera um, that they show during the race of him, of all lap, the first, the first lap of the race where he just overtakes, I think, 10 people on the first lap. It's absolutely incredible to watch. He just completely slices through the field. Um, he did an excellent job today. Absolutely. Well, not today. Uh, he did an excellent job. Absolutely incredible. Um, Chaz Moster in ninth. Again, he did pretty well just to hold on. Um, the Tickford cars, not as good in the races as they were in the first qualifying session. I think this owes to the fact that everyone was sort of taken aback from the first qualifying session. Um, so they just sort of held on. Um, Craig Lowndes, another big mover, up 15 spots into 10th place. Um, not that I want to take away from Craig because I love him, but um, not as impressive of Co as Courtney. Whereas uh, Courtney made most of his gains in the field, uh, Craig made a lot of his gains by pitting early and undercut undercutting everybody um, and just getting into clean air and running his own race for a while. Um, I mean, you know, not to take anything away from him, he still had to drive fast. He just didn't do as, as impressive of a job as Courtney did um, slicing his way through the field. But Craig still had to had to push his way through the field to get into that position. So good job to him. Excellent race, up 15 spots. He's been a real mover this year. I think there's a stat somewhere that says um, how many net positions that each driver has gained or lost this season. And Craig's gained the most by some incredible amount compared to the next person just because he keeps qualifying poorly and having to fight his way back. Um, so it still, still seems to be a few qualifying woes for him, um, which seem to have been ironed out for the other two Red Bull cars. Uh, Nick Perka in 11th, 
Not a bad drive. Uh, Slade down to 12th. Waters down to 13th. Fabian Coulthard up to 14th, up eight spots. Not a bad result considering where he started, but he really should be doing better than 14th in that car. Um, Blanchard, the first of the rookies in 15th, followed by LeBrock in 16th. David Reynolds not moving an inch from where he started and stayed in 17th spot. Very poor race from him um, in the first race. Uh, Scott Pye not doing anything like uh, James Courtney, but still moving up five spots to finish in 18th. Um, I'm pretty sure that um, before the race, they managed, they figured out how to dial in Courtney's car and just didn't get it for Pye's. Um, not that, you know, not that they weren't trying. Um, just these things happen. Sometimes you stumble upon the right combination of things and they didn't have a chance to test it between quality and race. So Courtney went out with a strong car. Pye went out with a stronger car. Um, than he had in qualifying, but not strong enough to get him 24 places up or whatever it was, 16 places up from where he started. Um, but um, after race one, obviously, they took the information they learned from Courtney's drive and they applied it to Scott's car and he did much better the next day. Uh, Heimgarner in 19th, Holdsworth in 20th. He had a bit of uh, a few cl- a few clashes with people down the grid, um, which owes to why he's down a little bit further than where he started. Uh, Golding in 21st. Stanaway up four spots to 22nd. He had a pretty bad race. Again, not really his fault. Um, he was hit by uh, Simona on lap two and spun around, which sort of took him out, really. Um, you know, it never helps. Um, which is unfortunate. He just seems to be... a magnet for trouble everything that bad everything bad that can happen just happens to him which is unfortunate i still really rate him i still think he's a good driver um and he's just waiting for that break um in a better car you know um craig's leaving so maybe they'll take him that'd be nice um simona in 23rd i believe no i think the second race is where she got a penalty but she's again just had really bad luck um it just been tangling with people. I think someone told her to be more aggressive. I remember hearing that a couple of races ago. And ever since then, she's just been hitting people and getting penalties. And <laughs> I think she needs to unlearn that advice. It's been awful. Um, I don't know. Maybe she's... I know she comes from a single-seater background. Did a bit of racing in Formula E and that sort of thing. So maybe she's just used to tiptoeing a bit. And she's just turned up the aggression now that she can be a bit more bargy in these cars. And is still finding her feet. It is only a second year after all. These things happen. Um, Anton Di Pasquale in 24th. Macaulay Jones 25th. Todd Hazelwood in 26th. Kirk Ostecki in 27th. And Garth Tander. Um, I'm not sure if he actually finished the race. He did. Uh, Garth Tander in 28th place. Down 18 spots because he um, parked up the car on lap 7 with an engine failure. Um, with a his crank angle sensor loom which is the thing that tells the sparks plugs to go, um, stopped working. So his engine just ceased, and he parked the car right up on the apex of the last turn. Um, So obviously they had to call a safety car for that. Um, I know he didn't have a choice, but (laughs) did he really have to park it there? It was in such a bad spot. It was right on top of the track, right at the apex of the last turn. Um, he couldn't probably have chosen a worse spot to put it. Um, I know he was just trying to get out of everyone's way and then the car just stopped while he was, you know, cutting the corner, um, trying to get back to the pits and he just didn't make it. Um, not really his fault, but still very awkward. I did sort of suck my, suck the air in through my, through my two teeth when I saw that and I was waiting for something bad to happen. Um, but these things happen. Um, otherwise... We had some new liveries for Caruso and again for Percat. Uh, he's been switching a billion times. Um, I think this is his third switch, Percat, in as many races. So there you go. And Caruso has signed, uh, has signed, has um, a new livery, um, Industrial Athlete, which, um, as uh, Scaife said many times, suits him perfectly, considering how strong of a driver he is, how aggressive he is. Um, and Percat was with the Mobile One livery, with X convenience on the hood, 
Um, I think he'll be switching back to one of the other liveries now that he's out of South Australia. I think that's a South Australia only thing. Not sure. Um, there you go. But um, otherwise, in the in that race, uh, the only other thing really to talk about is that the speed trap seemed to be placed in the braking area for turn one, <laughs> which I'm not sure. Not sure who did that. Um, because they had, uh, they had Larkham come up and talk about all the times they were getting down the pitch straight and there was a good 20 to 30 difference between some of them, kilometers an hour between some of them, some of them hitting 250, others at 220, others at 230. Um, and he eventually confirmed that, yeah, the, the speed trap, the speed marker was in the, right at the start of the braking area. So some people were able to, were flat out into the speed trap and other people were on the brakes. Um, really weird place to put it. Um, so I know you want to put it as far down the straight as possible to get the highest speed you can, but you know, you don't, <laughs> let me move it back a tad, but that's okay. Not a huge deal, is it? Um, so now we'll move on to qualifying for race two. A uh, very similar result for the top two drivers. Jamie Winkup in first with a 148.6, much more, uh, much closer to the times we were seeing in practice too. Um, but second place was Shane with a 149 flat. So I think, sorry, I think Jamie set his time. I think that was Jamie's lap one time. Yeah, it was. Um, and Shane set a 149, almost a second down from Wink Up on his first lap um, and had to improve. So uh, most people for most people that was true um so slade next of a 149.3 uh pie in fourth of a 149.4 so good recovery um clearly they learned a lot from saturday's race and applied it to both the cars um to get much better results caruso in fifth of a 149.5 craig lowndes in sixth of a 149.5 as well james courtney in seventh um, a 149.5 for him as well. Anton Di Pasquale, good job to him. The first rookie in eighth of a 149.5, two. Um, that's T double O, not the number two. Rick Kelly in ninth for 149.6, and Scott McLaughlin in tenth with a 149.6, a full second down on Jamie Winkup. Um, his second day was worse than his first day for sure. Um, and it really starts a qualifying. He just couldn't get a sold lap together. Um, and that was the end of it, really. You know? Um, unfortunate. Um, but Sandown's a much more traditional track. Been there a million times. They'll know what to do there. And we should see him back to proper form once the endurance season starts. Um, Heingartner in 11th. Back where he... Uh, back where we're used to seeing him during practice and things. David Reynolds a bit better in 12th, but still not really where he belongs. Uh, Coulthard, again, better, much better than yesterday. I keep saying yesterday like it's Sunday still. It's not Sunday, it's it's uh, Tuesday right now. But um, much better than on Saturday with a 13th place. Um, Cameron Waters in 14th, Nick Perkett in 15th, Will Davison in 16th, Mark Winterbottom in 17th. So Tickford Cars back down the order again, which is unfortunate to see. Garf Tander in 18th, Jack LeBrock in 19th, the second of the rookies, way down from uh, Di Pasquale. Macaulay Jones in 20th, good job to him for qualifying quite consistently in um, 19th for Saturday, 20th for Sunday. Simona in 21st, um, again, Lee Holdsworth in 22nd, where, we're used to being, where we've been used to seeing him, if I'm being honest. Tim Blanchard in 23rd. I don't know what happened on Saturday, but Sunday he's back to where he's normally at for most of the season, which, you know, it was good to see him up there. He actually did really well in the race too. I think qualifying, being out of the pack means a lot in supercars. Um, Mostert in 24th, two seconds down. I don't really know why. I don't know what happened to him. He just sort of didn't do great. Um, I don't really have an answer for that one. I was watching him. And he just didn't seem to get a lap together. So I don't know if that's the dust. He did go off quite a few times due to the dust. Um, but he also put together a solid lap. One without 
going off the track and he just, just didn't seem to work for him. So, I don't know. I don't know what happened. It's his worst qualifying position of the season, supposedly. Um, but in 25th, we had James Gold in Kirk Kostecki in 26th, Richie Stanaway in 27th, and Todd Hazelwood in 28th. Richie Stanaway was given a, a three grid place penalty for um, impeding uh, someone uh, James's, James Golding's lap, I think, during qualifying. Um, and because he only started, because he only qualified in twenty seventh, though he was given a one place group penalty, and he'll be given a, and he'll take a two place group penalty at Sandown, which is <laughs> an interesting way of doing it. I don't think I've ever heard of that before, um, but that's okay. Um, and yeah, Todd Hazelwood in twenty eighth, as I said, um, again really far off the pace. Uh, Rich Stanaway two point five seconds down, and Todd Hazelwood three point three seconds down. So. Not sure what's going on. I, clearly, the Holden's a switch, and that's probably got a lot to do with it. Um, which so it's unfortunate to see him a bit held back again. Um, but anyway, on to the race. Jamie Winkup finishing in first place, followed by Shane in second. So another uh, a Red Bull one two. David Reynolds in third, moving up nine spots. He did really well. He did really well on Sunday to uh, pull that out. He just sort of. Kept quiet. They just kind of pitted him out of traffic, got him going, just got him going around, you know. Just had a nice solid race um, and took advantage of a small mistake uh, that Tim Slade made um, going into turn one late in the race where he locked up, went wide, and David inherited third position to get a podium, and Tim Slade finished in fourth. I was really looking forward to seeing Slade on a podium. It's been ages since I've seen him there. Um... I was really happy to see him do really well, so I was kind of disappointed when he um when Reynolds took it from him. But you know, anything that adds fuel to the championship fight is good. Um Perkat in fifth, up ten spots, excellent race from him as well. Scott Pye in sixth, nice and solid. Will Davison in seventh again. Good weekend to him. Leon's in eighth, not terrible. They I think they went a little bit too aggressive with his strategy, um, with his pit strategy, and he just kinda of dropped off at the end. Same with Michael Caruso. Very aggressive strategy. It just didn't quite work out for them. Um, you know, these things happen. you got to take a risk. And it just didn't work out for Craig or, or uh, Caruso. Scott McLaughlin, not moving an inch again. Um, well, sorry, not again. Uh, but not moving an inch from 10th spot, finishing in 10th. Um, unfortunate for him. But still not a terrible result considering where his teammate finished. He could be a lot worse. Um, Anton Di Pasquale, the first of the rookies in 11th place, didn't quite keep manage to keep his nose out of trouble. Um, I will get to it more in detail after the results, but he, um, what did he do? Um, he spun Jack LeBrock on lap one, I believe. Pretty sure that's what happened. Yeah, he did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was this race. Might have been race one, but he spun Jack LeBrock on lap one. Um, again, which is the third time in three races that he's had that he's been given a penalty. Um, so I'll talk about more about what that means for him after the results. But unfortunate to see him constantly getting into trouble. Um, he really needs to, I know he's a rookie, but he really needs to just keep his nose out for a couple of races. Just be quiet for a bit. Um, Chaz in 12th place, moving up 12 positions, ended up the strongest of the Tickford cars. Um, he's got great race craft, um, and he just, he just manages to push his way up through the field. Um, and they're good, they, they got good pit stop strategy for him going. Typically, I think that's why he ends up always finishing quite strong. He's just a better racer at the moment. So, good to see him recover a little bit. Um, and it, yeah, it's always it's always sad to see Mostert and any of the Tickford guys down the pack, um, especially this year, just because they've been having an awful year. So, good to see him recover a little bit. James Courtney into 13th, down six spots. Um, I don't, 
I don't really know what happened to him. I don't think anything in particular happened. He did run off the track from... He was in 10th spot, McLaughlin in 11th, and he ran off the track and lost a bunch of spots. I think he only lost one spot, though. I'm not sure. I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but whatever the case, he finished down in 13th. Followed by Fabian Coulthard in 14th. Not a great race from him. He dropped one spot from qualifying. Um, I've just not been impressed with Coulthard this year. He's gotten one win, I think, at Winton. And that's it. I think that's it. Just not not where he should be, considering he's in the number two car uh, with the number one car um, fighting for the championship, you know? He should be much further up than he is. I think he's only fifth or sixth in the championship as well, and he's he's way behind um, Shane and Scott. He just should be up there. He should be up there more often. We should be seeing him fighting for wins. Um, Cameron Waters in 15th. Mark Witterbottom in 16th. Rick Kelly in 17th. And if you're a Rick Kelly fan, the reason why he was dropping so, da- so far down through the field is because he had an issue with his gear sensor. Um, so he's not just a, he he wasn't driving terribly. He had a legitimate issue with his car, which I will discuss more after the results. Jack LeBrock in eighteenth, Macaulay Jones in nineteenth. Not a bad race for either of them. Garth Tander in twentieth. Um, he had a lot of problems. He had a, he had a few issues along with a uh, um, along with a few incidents with uh, with Heimgartner. Surprisingly, some interesting problems he had with Heimgartner. So, I'll get to that. Uh, Tim Blanchard in 21st. Richie Stanaway in 22nd. He had a bad day, that's for sure. Um, I believe he... He was... Um, he was involved with Kurt Kostecki on lap one. Um, where... LeBrock was sort of punted off the track a bit. I forget what turn it was. I think it might have been turn four. Um, four or five or six. Something like that. Um, where LeBrock was sort of nudged off the track a bit, as sort of, as happens at the start of a race. Um, people tend to get nudged off the track. And he, as he was rejoining, um, Kostecki just got, unfortunately, a bit squeezed by Stanaway and LeBrock due to his rejoin. And... It resulted in a, a huge amount of damage to his right rear, and he ended up retiring on lap one. So unfortunate to see Kostecki retiring so early. Um, this sort of thing, this sort of thing is uh, it happens. You know what happens, especially when you're fighting down the back of the field. But the experience that you'll get as a wild card driver, it doesn't mean much when you don't finish the race. So, you know, uh, unfortunate for him. Uh, Simona in twenty third after being given a drive through penalty. For unsafe release in pit lane. Um, she's just been getting all sorts of penalties. And she just needs to sort of chill out, I guess. <laughs> that would help. Um, that would help a lot. Uh, James Golding in 24th. Todd Hazelwood in 25th. And not classified Lee Holdsworth with a drive shaft failure um, on lap 20. Andre Heimgartner on lap 4. Yeah, slap four. That was a lot, a lot earlier than I thought it was, actually. Um, retired on lap four after running into the back of Garth Tander coming into pit lane. Um, he completely m- destroyed the front of his car. Not so badly that he couldn't race anymore. So they put more, they put new tires on him as they were going to. Tried to do a quick, tried to do a quick fix up while he was in the pits. But because he'd run into Garth on his way in, they weren't quite sure if the bodywork was going to interfere with the tyres. Um, and to make things worse, Garth was released right in front of Heimgartner and he ran into him again. <laughs> he ran into him again in the middle of pit lane. It made the problem worse. So as soon as... So Garth went out with um, his rear under tray hanging off the back of his car and Heimgartner went out and it, the bodywork was just rubbing on his tyres and smoke going everywhere. Um... So he had to come in, and they ended up just retiring him from the race. And apparently, he hit him so hard that Garth hurt his back and neck as well. So hopefully, he feels okay. He was able to finish the race, but um, 
unfortunate for both of them. I don't know why they didn't examine... I don't know why they didn't examine it as an unsafe pit release. Um, you can see if, if you watch back any... If you watch it back, you can see Heimgartner has to put on the brakes. And even so, he still runs into the back of Garf. Um, and considering that Simona got an unsafe pit release for... Um, I'm not even sure what happened to her. Like, they didn't show it. She was just... They just said she's got an unsafe pit release, has to go through pit lane. Um, considering that she got an unsafe pit release for something that was so undramatic that they didn't even bother to show it or talk about it. Um, the fact that they released Tander right in front of Heimgartner and he had to slam on the brakes and still ran into the back of him and hurt Tander in the process really makes me think that they should have analysed it for an unsafe pit release. I don't know if that's up to the Nissan team to say, hey, what the hell is this? You need to examine this. Um, because as we'll talk about later on, um, that is what that is one of the things happened today. Uh, Techno, Techno uh, brought up the fact that uh, Pasquale spun LeBrock and had them investigate it, and that's the only reason they looked into it. Um, so they can request an investigation, and I don't know if they just didn't do that, so it, nothing happened, um, but it looked a bit off to me, um, I might be completely wrong, you know, I might just be talking, I might just be completely wrong, feel free to yell at me, um, but it just, it just looked off, you know, it just didn't look right, um, considering, you know, like, you shouldn't, drivers shouldn't be getting hurt in the pits, they're going about 60 k's an hour, they shouldn't be doing that, um, I think it might be 40 k's actually, so, it's a bit ridiculous, a bit ridiculous that, that happened and no one really brought it up. It just sort of went went by like nothing, like it was completely normal for them to run into the back of each other in pit lane. Um, on entry, yeah, that's just Heimgartner's fault. He just overjudged how long it would take him to stop. But when they're in the middle of the pits and Heimgartner's trundling down at 40 k's an hour, he shouldn't have to worry about Garf suddenly popping up in front of him and slamming on the brakes to allow him to get going. That's not what pit lane's for. That's not how it works. Um, Garf should have stayed on the... I mean, Garf could have stayed on the little the the left hand side there with the empty side until they got to the end and sorted each other out. He didn't have to pop right in front of Heimgartner. I don't know. I think something needs to be looked at there. No one really brought it up, but Heimgartner shouldn't have to worry about slamming on the brakes because someone's popped up in front of him. It's just it's not really part of how pit lane works. Um, but anyway, feel free to tell me I'm wrong because I probably am. <laughs> so uh, into the championship standings though. Shane Van Gisbergen, for the first time in a long time, for, since I think Adelaide, is now at the front of the championship with 2,778 points. 19 points behind is Scott McLaughlin, which I think is the same margin that he lost by last year, so he'll be having a few nightmares about that. Um, James Courtney going off the track and letting Scott through actually made the deficit go from 25 to 19. So we'll see if those six points makes a difference come the end of the championship. And if it does, I'm calling it. James Courtney going off the track made all the difference. I'm calling it right now. Uh, Jamie Winkup coming back a tiny bit. Um, actually, I think overall he made a net loss, but <laughs> I might be completely wrong about that. Um, but he's 362 points down which is just over one race weekend. Remember, a race weekend is 300 points total. Craig Lowndes, 549 points down, followed by David Reynolds, who has been overtaken by Craig Lowndes, with 565 points down. Coulthard in sixth place, who's just out of the picture completely, I think. I think it's safe to say the top five are on their own and can win. Anyone else who's below David Reynolds now, not a chance in the world. Because Fabian Coulthard is 856 points off the lead. So unless everybody in front of him has an awful weekend during Enduros, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, Rick Kelly, same story. 860 points down. Followed by Chaz, 886 points down. And then another chasm back to Tim Slade, who's 1,000 points. And Scott Pye, who's 1,076 points. Down from the leader. After that, we've got Nick Perkett in 11th, followed by Mark Winterbottom, James Courtney in, in 13th, Garth Tander in 14th, Michael Caruso in 15th, Will Davison in 16th, Cameron Waters in 17th, Jack LeBrock, the first of the rookies, in 18th, Heimgartner in 19th, Deeper Squally in 20th with 95 penalty points. 
<laughs> taken away from his total, 95. So for, I think, four separate penalties. Lee Holdsworth in 21st, Simona De Silvestro in 22nd, James Golding in 23rd, Tim Blanchard in 24th, Richie Stanaway in 25th, Todd Hazelwood in 26th, and Macaulay Jones, wildcard entrance in 27th, and Kirk Kostecki, second wildcard entrant in 28th. Um, and in the teams, Red Bull, Red Bull, sorry, not Red Bull, Red Bull, safely at the top. With 5,194, followed by Shell at 4,681. Um, Bradley Jones Racing is now moved up into third. Um, with, um, I believe, Tickford was above them. Now they are at, um, and by Bradley Jones, I mean, I mean Nick Perkat and Tim Slade. With 3,435 points, very closely followed by Mark Winterbottom and Chaz Mostert with 3,424 points. Erebus is next, which is David Reynolds and Deepa Squally, followed by Mobile One Boost Mobile Racing, which we all know as Walkinshaw Andretti, which is uh, in six. Um, Rick Kelly and Andre Heimgartner in seventh. Michael Caruso and Simona in eighth. Gary Rogers Motorsport in ninth. Lowndes in tenth. Um... Waters and Stanaway in 11th, Will Davison in 12th, Jack LeBrock in 13th, Lee Holdsworth in 14th, um, Tim Blanchard in 15th, and Todd Hazelwood in 16th place in the team's championships. And now we move on to the news, and I want to start with the thing that pretty much everyone was talking about. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm just so excited about this. Um... So, qualifying one. I didn't bring it up while I was talking about the results because I wanted to talk about it now. Um, two things happened, both involving the Red Bull cars. Um, first, uh, Jamie Winkup was spun. Well, he wasn't spun. He actually just spun out on his own um, at turn 12. And after waiting for about 20 seconds or so, um, he chooses to rejoin the track right as James Golding is on a flying lap going past him and nearly takes him out. James has to take evasive action to avoid him. And Winkup was not given a penalty for unsafe re-entry. Now, when I first saw this, I thought that was a bit off. I'm not going to lie. Um, I thought that deserved an unsafe re-entry penalty for sure. A grid position drop or something for sure. Um, however, however, um, after looking at the article released by supercars.com, um, there is another side of the story. Um, so, uh, here's a quote from Winkup. I had a look at the footage. I was stopped for like 20 seconds or so. By that time, it should have been yellow. Yellow flags are out. No one can go fast. So that's where it's at. You never want to do anything untoward, but I felt like I did absolutely everything I could. I was sideways on the track. Hopefully, everyone had slowed down. I slowly went around, and unfortunately, James was still on his hot lap. You always feel bad, nothing deliberate, but you can only do what you can do. Um, yeah, obviously, James did the best he could. My main concern is that the team didn't tell him that there were cars coming around. They really should be more communication than this. Um, but Winkup does bring up a good point that he was stopped on the track long enough to bring yellow flags out. Um, and flat and cars should not have been on a hot lap, but that does not mean that you can just pull out in front of a car. Uh, just because there's a yellow flag out, yeah, you're not you're not going as fast as you possibly can, but you're still in a car and you're still driving at what us normal humans, <laughs> people who don't race cars for a living, would consider to be a high speed. You're still going about 100, 150 k's an hour. You're not slow. <coughs> Oh, sorry, I'm just so excited. Um, <laughs> you're not going slow. You, you're still going really fast, just not racing car fast. Um, so, um, into the uh, steward statement about this incident, um, a request for investigation having, having been received from Gary Rogers Motorsport, um, uh, the DRD conducted a post-session investigation into an allegation of careless driving by the driver of car number one, Jamie Winkup, who turned in front of car number 34, James Golding, after having spun at the exit of turn 12. After reviewing TV broadcast footage and judicial camera footage from car number one, um, 
We determined that the matter did not warrant referral to the stewards because car number 34 was in a sector where yellow flags were displayed at the time as a result of car number one being across the circuit at exit of 12. Um, yeah, James shouldn't have been on a flying lap because there was yellow flags supposedly out. They didn't see any. I didn't see any in footage. Um, but supposedly yellow flags were out in that sector. Um, and James should not have been going on a hot lap. Um, so he is to blame for that. But I still don't think that uh, Wink Cup should have gotten off scot free from that. An unsafe entry is an unsafe re-entry is an unsafe re-entry, and he nearly could have had a really bad accident with James. Um, I know it's unfortunate, but these things happen. You know, that's that's what happens when you spin out. You take that risk. Um, I know that there's a rise there. He can't see over the crest. I know he probably couldn't have seen him coming. Um, but these things happen, you know. You can't just say... You can't just go. <laughs> you can't just hope that there's no one going to be there. That's what marshals are for. They're there to signal you. They're there to tell you to go. Um, so, yeah, some of the blame can be put on James. Um... He shouldn't have been going as fast as he was. But regardless, I still think that Jamie deserved a penalty for um, just for entering the track the way he did. I don't think he should have done that. <coughs> um, and I just... Sorry, excuse me. Just coughing away. And I just don't think... <sighs> the stewards have been a little inconsistent this year and it's not great. And it's not the only controversial call they made because in the very same qualifying session involving the same team, uh, we had an issue towards the end of the session where um, as I think what's happening is they're coming up on the last corner. Scott McLaughlin's in front of Shane Van Gisbergen. And as they're about to... Um, as they're about to start their hot lap... Uh, both of them start up and then Scott backs off to warm up his tyres more and then gets going again. This puts Shane at a minus, at a deficit for the lap because he was going and has to slow up for Scott and then go again. So this doesn't ruin his lap, but he doesn't get a good lap out of it. Um, and then on the way back around, I think it's after doing their hot lap, I think... It's, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell what they're doing. I, uh, the first time around, they're about to start their hot lap. That's for sure. The second time, I'll just explain it. Um, into turn three, so right at the start of the track, Shane slows up right in front of Scott. He doesn't brake check him. You can see the footage. Um, if you uh, go to the article on supercars.com, you can see the onboard footage from Scott's car. And he doesn't, he doesn't brake check him. He's not right in front of Scott when it happens. He just slows up quite dramatically for turn three. Um, now, if you, when I was watching the race, it just kind of looked like they were just sort of exchanging some issues with each other. Shane was getting some revenge for Scott slowing him, him up. Um, and it looks like they're on their outlap. I think, I don't think they're on their hot lap, but, um, it looks like they're on their outlap. It's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell. Um, and at the time, I thought it was a bit, eh, you know, not great sportsmanship, but I don't think it deserved a penalty at the time. Um, neither of them are driving dangerously. They're just impeding each other and being idiots about it. Um, I don't think Scott was aware that he impeded Shane, though. Hence his reaction. He sort of waves a hand in the air when Shane holds him up. But, again, after reading the article... There is a reason why Shane slams the brakes on or uh, slows up so dramatically. Um, he says, On the outlap at the go point I went, he went and then he slowed and started warming up his tyres, so I did everything I could to get past. So that's when uh, uh, Scott was block, uh, blocked Shane. Um, we both had average starts to the laps, did our laps, then going into turn one, there was yellows. So this is on the in-lap. So they're slow slowing up and... Shane sees the yellow flags are out. So I slowed up and didn't bother getting out of his way because you can't go faster and both our laps were ruined. So no issues. So it looks like they were both going on a second lap 
The yellow flag came out. Shane slows up. Doesn't bother to come out of the way of Scott because he reckons that Scott's going to slow up as well. Clearly, Scott didn't see the yellow flag. Um, I don't remember. I don't recall seeing yellow flag either. But again, when we saw this in the broadcast, it was it was a long, a long after it actually happened. I think it was after even qualifying that they showed it. Um, so it's hard to tell. It's really hard to judge. But. According to the steward statement, after receiving a request for investigation from a uh, racing team, <laughs> whoever that is, um, the um, we conducted a post-session investigation into an allegation that car number 97, Shane Van Gisbergen, blocked car number 17, Scott McLaughlin, at turn 1-2. to two. Following a review of TV broadcast footage and judicial camera footage from car number 17 and car number 97, Car number 97 was determined to have been in a sector where the yellow flags were displayed, and accordingly, the matter did not warrant referral to the stewards. <coughs> oh, I'm just coughing all day today. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I didn't see any yellow flags at the time. That doesn't mean there weren't any. Um, I don't think this one deserved a penalty, but I do think it was a little unsportsmanlike, and I do think Shane was getting some kind of revenge um, in the usual Shane way. We know Shane's a bit aggressive of a driver. That's not a secret. I think he was just doing his typical Shane thing, being a bit of a dick about it. That's what he does. Um, does that excuse it? No, not really. Does it deserve a penalty, though? I don't think so. I don't think that deserved a penalty. He didn't brake check him. He wasn't right in front of him and slammed on the brakes. He just slowed up significantly. Um, and he was quite far away when he started slowing up. Scott had plenty of time to react. The reason why Scott's mad is because it's ruined his lap. But yellow flag was out and his lap was ruined anyway. Um, so no reckless driving. Um, and both their laps would have been done regardless so no harm, no foul. Should Shane have gotten out of the way? Probably. Um, but, you know, that's just Shane for you. That's what he does. And I don't really think it deserves a penalty. Maybe you're talking to from his teams, from his uh, his higher-ups in his team, but not really a penalty. Um, and that's only the start of the controversy. We're only starting this one. Um, so now we'll move on to... We'll stay with Triple Eight. Why not? Uh, Triple Eight fined for champagne breach. <laughs> this is probably the strangest thing I've seen happen this year, or in a long time, really. Uh, from supercars.com, Triple Eight has been fined for Jamie Winkup's podium celebration after winning the second leg of the Super Sprint. Okay, so for those of you who didn't continue watching the race afterwards, um, after the race was done, uh, Jamie Winkup, you know, they do their usual podium celebration where they uh, spray the champagne everywhere. And uh, David Reynolds tells Jamie to drop the champagne down to a team member, a teammate below the podium because the podium is raised. Um, it's on the second story of the team garages. And David Reynolds says, um, well, sorry, I assume one of the team members down on the ground asks Jamie if he can have the champagne and Reynolds encourages him to drop it. Jamie does drop it, and according to um, according to the regulations, the stewards fine Triple Eight one thousand dollars because it's against the rules to drop the champagne from the podium. <laughs> um, they said during the podium presentation, the driver of car number one was observed to drop a champagne bottle from the podium to a crew member, which is specifically prohibited in the end of race procedure. The stewards' report read after. Uh, after an admission to the breach of end of race procedure by the team of car number one, the stewards imposed a fine of $1,000 on triple eight race engineering. <laughs> I've never, I've never heard of that before. Um, I also don't know why they find the team and not the driver. I'm not really sure how it's the team's fault that Jamie dropped some champagne down. Like in a way, Shane, Shane is getting Shane, Shane, his engineers, his pit crew, they're all getting punished for something that Jamie did. <laughs> That's a really weird decision. 
Um, I kind of understand why the rule's there. Because, yeah, a full champagne bottle's pretty damn heavy. And you don't want to clonk anyone in the head with it. So I kind of get it. But <laughs> at the same time, it's such a ridiculous rule. And, and I've never seen it enforced before. Like, I don't know where this came from. I didn't even know it was a rule. And I'm sure they didn't know it was a rule either. Judging by the reactions to everybody, I don't think anyone knew it was a rule. Um, and suddenly they're being fined a $1,000. I think a warning would have done. <laughs> Just to make everyone aware that this is a thing they need to not do. I think that's the main issue. They just didn't know they weren't allowed to do it. Um, but the, the strange penalties continue. Because, remember how I said that um, Richie Stanaway is going to carry a two-place group penalty in Sandown for impeding someone in qualifying? Well, it gets worse for Stanaway. Because Tickford Racing have been penalised for not having an, uh, a memory card, of all things, in Richie Stanaway's onboard judicial camera. <laughs> The team championship entry of Cameron Waters and Stoneaway have also been docked 50 points. Uh, they said in a statement, following the race car number 56, Richie Stoneaway was discovered by the um, by the stewards not to have a SD card installed in its judicial camera in breach of Rule D 20.3.1. After an admission to the breach, the stewards report uh, sorry the stewards imposed a penalty of loss of 50 teams championship points on Tickford Racing. In the championship. Um, <laughs> again, kind of an interesting penalty. I'm sure they just forgot. Um, yeah, again, I mean, I can see why that one's in place. You can't just have people taking out their, uh, their memory cards. They, they, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff can happen then. Um, but just it just gets worse for Richie. I just, he can't get a break, can he? Um, but we're not... <laughs> We're not stopping here because um, De Pasquale also got a a uh, penalty. It's a two-part penalty, which I've never heard of either. Um, Stewart's handed out a two-part penalty to Anton De Pasquale after the rookie was found to have committed careless driving for the third time in four events. So the first time was with Caruso at Townsville where he spun him out and crashed him into the tyre barrier. The second time was also at Caruso at the Sydney uh, Motorsport Park, which was last round, where he spun him out again. And this time he spun out Jack LeBrock. So the third time in four races, um, the Erebus driver made contact with Jack LeBrock at turn one on the opening lap of the inaugural supercars race at the Bend Motorsport Park. Both Holden spun to the back of the field as a result, Jack LeBrock finishing, uh, recovering to finish 16th and eight places ahead of Di Pasquale. After a post-race investigation, Di Pasquale has copped a 25-point penalty and been fined $3,000, of which $2,000 is suspended until the 31st of December. Why is it suspended? I don't know. <laughs> Does he not have the money to pay it? Is that what they're worried about? I, I honestly don't know what... The, what. <laughs> I don't know why they've suspended half of the fine. Really weird decision. I think maybe they're worried that he can't afford it. Maybe. I'm not sure, though. Um, the deputy race director, Michael Massey, uh, conducted a post-race investigation into an incident involving car number 19, Jack LeBrock, and car number 99, Anton Di Pasquale, at turn one on lap one following a request, f a, a request for investigation from Techno Autosports. The driver of car number 99 was found to have made careless contact with car number 19, causing car number 19 to spin off track to the back of the field in breach of Schedule B2, Article 2.1.1, careless driving. Following an admission to the breach, the stewards imposed a penalty loss of 25 2018 Virgin Australia Supercars Championship points, together with a fine of $3,000, of which $2,000 is suspended in respect of any breach of, se of Schedule B2 Article 2 until the 31st of December. So the real reason why they're, suspe they're suspending most of the fine is because if he does it again, the fine's going to get bigger. That's the main reason for it. Um, 
Is that not the same thing as giving him a $3,000 fine now and then giving him another fine when he does it? <laughs> Wouldn't he have to pay the same amount of money after all? Like, is there something special that happens? Does he get a Christmas bonus? Like, what? why are we waiting until the 31st of December? I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason. If you know the reason, please tell me. I really don't know. I'm kind of baffled. Um, <laughs> but that's that's the um, that's the be-all and end-all of it. Um Deep Pasquale penalized basically three thousand dollars, a thousand of which to pay now, two thousand to pay later. Um, it keeps going though, because Garth Tander was also penalized. <laughs> what would Garth Tander be penalized for? Do you think? Do you think he was penalized for unsafe, uh, unsafe um, entry, unsafe relief? Sorry, from the pit lane involving Andre Andre Heimgartner. You'd be wrong, because this penalty is for something that happened in race one. What happened to Garth Tender in race one, you might be asking. All he did was have an engine problem, go back to the garage and come out and do a few more laps. You're right. That is all he did. And apparently that's what the problem is. Garth Tender has also been handed a post-race penalty with 90 seconds added to his race time. 90. For failing to undertake a compulsory pit stop. Okay. So your next question is probably... But he was in the garage. <laughs> How did he not do his pit stop? Um, apparently, to count as an official pit stop, you have to change your tyres. And they didn't change his tyres while he was in the garage. They just fixed his engine and put him back out again. So he technically didn't finish his pit stop. Which means... Which means that he had to be given a 90 second penalty when he was already several laps down and firmly in last place yeah i get that they need to enforce the rules but he doesn't need a 90 second penalty he was already in last there was no way he wasn't going to be in last what's the point <laughs> so strange such a strange result um <laughs> I, I don't know what to say about that it's just like kicking a man while he's down he didn't deserve a penalty for that um Maybe find the team. Oh, excuse me. I hope that didn't come through. Just burped into the microphone. Um, I don't, it doesn't even deserve a fine. I don't know what it deserves. Maybe dock their championship points. Like, it's such a weird such a weird thing to do maybe they were maybe the rule is to dock championship points so instead they gave him a time penalty because that doesn't dock any points because he finished the same spot anyway just a really weird thing to do to someone in last place <laughs> just really weird i get that they've got to enforce their rules they can't just not punish him um but 90 seconds from last like my gosh that's a long penalty that's huge if that happened and if he was in an actual position and that happened, that would put him into, like, last place. Guaranteed. <laughs> so, weird. Weird, really harsh penalty for someone that, you know, like I said, was down. Was down and pretty much out of the race. Um, so, we've finally gotten through all the penalties. <laughs> My gosh, a lot of things happened. Um, in other news, a bit more lighthearted news now. Um, Rick Kelly in the second race had a poor result because he had a faulty um, electronic control unit so an ECU um, the issue was uh, Scott, Sin Scott Sinclair explains to supercars.com that we had a sense of failure and that was throwing the shifts out Every time he changed gear, he didn't know what he was going to get. Sometimes it was putting a heap of fuel in and sometimes no fuel, so it just lost a heap of straight line, straight line speed. We've got to get to the bottom of it, bottom of it so it, to make sure it doesn't happen again. So basically what was happening is that the ECU didn't know what gear Rick Kelly was in and didn't know how much, as a result, how much fuel to give him. So if he's in first gear, don't give him as much fuel as if he's in um, sixth gear. Because if you're in sixth gear, you're pushing the engine as hard as you can and want to go as fast as possible. And if you're in first gear, you don't need to do that. Because you're, going, you're in first gear. You don't need as much fuel um, to drive the gears as hard. Um, so the ECU, responsible for knowing what gear the car's in, didn't know what gear the car was in, and therefore 
Gave him the wrong amount of fuel, which is why he was so slow and dropped down the field the way he did. Um, so if you're a Kelly fan and you were disappointed by the second race, don't worry. Nothing happened. Um, well, it wasn't the driver's fault. It wasn't a setup fault. His car just didn't work properly. These things happen. And last up, um, Red Bull Racing, otherwise known as Triple Eight Racing, have broken the all-time win record for a team. Um, Shane Van Gisbergen and Jamie Winkup claimed a victory apiece at Tail and Bend, taking Triple Eight's tally to 181 since it entered supercars at the 2003 Sandown 500. Roland Dane's operation started the weekend on 179 wins. One behind Walkinshaw and Dreddy United, which used to be Holden Racing Team, um, who were at 180 wins. Triple Eight's new record has come from 471 races at a strike rate of a victory every 2.6 races since 2003. That's ridiculous. <laughs> With Walkinshaw having now started 779 races since its Amaru Park 1990 debut. Next best is uh, DJR Tim Penske with 101 victories in 872 races since Simon Plains in 1981. So that's something to celebrate for Triple Eights. If you're a Triple Eight fan, woohoo, look at that. You have got the most amount of wins now ahead of, um, ahead of what used to be Holden Racing Team who I don't see getting another win this year. Um, actually, no, that's not true. They might do really well in Enduros because we'll move on to what's com- happening next. It's time for Enduro season. Hell yeah. Enduro season is the best part of the calendar as far as I'm concerned. It's where we get, we get co-drivers. The field doubles in drivers. We get races that are super long. We get qualifying that's not important because <laughs> the races are so long. No, that's not true. That's not true at all. But um, we do get Sandown. We do get Bathurst, two of my favorite tracks on the calendar. Co-drivers, we're going to have um, pit stops. We're going to have pit stops where mistakes are going to happen. We're going to have brake failures. We're going to have big crashes. We're going to have high speeds at Sandown. We're going to have intense tire and fuel strategies we're going to have fuel saving we're going to have all sorts of things happen and in three weeks from now we go racing at the Sandown 500 i can't wait last year's winners richie stunaway and cameron waters i don't think that's going to happen this year who will win this year no idea i am so excited to find out though i love endurance season and that means with the Sandown 500 coming up we are One round away from the Bathurst 1000, the biggest race of the year. I cannot wait for endurance season. I might make a podcast before the 500, uh, going over who all the co-drivers are, making my predictions for endurance season, seeing how things go. Sorry, let me talk properly. Seeing how things go. Um, Let me know if you'd want that. Leave a comment or something. I might do it. I'm thinking about it. But anyway, three weeks until endurance season. Three weeks. So excited. Can't wait. I will see you in the next podcast, either discussing all the co-drivers and uh, things coming up for endurance season or just talking about the results for the Sandown 500. It's going to be so good. I cannot wait. Sandown always delivers. Until next time, I, my name has been Kendall. I will see you at the endurance round for the V8 Supercars, the Sandown 500. See you then.